So a bit about myself, um, I'm a second year BMC student who's been using Blender since I think 2.59, so a bit shy of 10 years now. Um, and I know this, the title of this workshop is pretty ambiguous, but it's a, a it's high level purpose is really to show how Blender's real-time engine EV can really accelerate a production pipeline um, through fast iteration and how it's helped democratize a lot of content creation. Um, this is really um, relevant in our uh, field as niches are ours, where we're oftentimes working independently or in small teams and a render farm or having like a dual 39 setup is not an option. So like these are a few shots from like various animation projects I've worked on in the past few years, some more biomedical, some more engineering. And while the scenes themselves are pretty basic, um, what I think is more relevant is that a lot of these like quick shots were set up, rendered and composited within like a morning or an afternoon. And um, this shot in particular, um, it was, I built it around five years ago and when EV came out and became stable, um, it, I realized that it was like a potential tool within our field because at a 4 million polygon scene, it isn't supposed to be like lightweight or optimized, but I was able to knock it out within about 15 seconds per frame at about full HD. Um, just stop that. <laughs> so I'm just going to like, um, I'm going to like briefly go over um, what EV does. And I'm also going to touch on a bit of the geometry nodes scripting system, which recently became stable in um, Blender 2.93, which is why I asked for it to be upgraded for this demo. Um, so because a lot of, uh, probably should have seen. So this is probably, uh, yeah. So this is the scene I'm planning on trying to recreate here. And I'm able to navigate it in real time. And there's a bunch of subsurface. There's volumetrics everywhere. Um, if I wanted to, I guess, change the light color, I could do that pretty quickly. And like again, I'm not like ray tracing anything here. This is all in real time. And that was what like really impressed me to the point where I wanted to include it as part of my regular pipeline. And I picked this scene in particular because um, when I remember thinking back to uh, one of the pain points that a lot of the Malvis students had during they were taking the course was that they would always try pushing um, shots full of like membranes and subsurface scattering. And they would do this only to hear their fans scream pain for several hours. So this is a way in which I'm trying to make it a bit more accessible in terms of like rendering like really pretty shots with subsurface scattering and all the, the fancy lighting. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a brief introduction of how um, real-time or rasterized rendering works. So we can take advantage of it early on. So, and in the meantime, um, I guess you can download the necessary files that I, I recently sent out. So if you worked in a game engine, um, re rendering, like if you've worked in, sorry, if you most of us are familiar with um, ray tracing, I think. So it's the, the basic concept is the, the camera shoots out a ray from the origin, it passes through the the pixel grid, it hits the scene object, bounces around, and reaches the light source. Um, we love this because it gives us some great soft shadows, color cast, global illumination, whatnot. So however, um, if we switch to our real-time engine, you'll notice that we lose this. It's the, the shadow is a lot harsher. Um, we lose a lot of the ambient occlusion. There's no bounce lighting, really. And you'll notice that also there's some pixelation anti-aliasing issues along the shadows. And this is because um, rasterization, it's really just a, it's limited to calculating direct lighting. And it's basically a backwards method in which, uh, it's probably, in which instead of the array projecting the camera to the object, the image of the scene within the bounds of the camera, it's projected backwards onto the pixel grid to the camera. And because of this, it doesn't really prescribe a particular way to compute colors of the pixels, and it doesn't really calculate shading um, and physical light, and it's thus unable to calculate global illumination. However, we have a few workarounds for this. Um, the first one is our screen space effects. So if I start at, um, enabling these toggles, um, I'm almost going to enable that. You'll notice that we get some of the, the lighting back in. 
And all of these screen space effects are really just post-processing effects that affect the, the bounds of the, the camera, um, the bounds of the camera. And if you've worked in a game engine, this should be very familiar. Um, the second way to do to improve our lighting is on baked lighting. So this is basically using light probes um, to pre-calculate indirect lighting only for static objects and surfaces that we know ahead of time aren't going to be moving. And I can add that by just going shift A and adding a light probe. And I would just scale that to fit the, the side of the container. And this way, a lot of the slower done computation of objects that don't change can be um, pre-calculated once um, instead of on free and update, and it'll still be collect, um, correct at runtime. And we commonly know this as um, baking our light maps. So if I wanted to bake a light map, again, I already have my, my probe set up. Um, I would need to designate basically the, the objects that I don't want to be, I want to be static. So aren't going to be moving throughout the scene and objects that will be moving throughout the scene. So I've, so the room itself, I expect to not move, but if I assume that the monkey is going to move, I would put that in a separate category. So I put um, this, the Cornell box into a static collection, which I did by M new collection. And I've just put it in there. And when I go down to, when I click the, my, my light probe, I basically just told it I wanted to bake for the static collection. And if I go back to my render settings, I can bake the lighting. And you'll notice that it brings it back in a bit, but we can enhance it a bit more by using this um, screen add-on that I also suggested called SSGI for EV. It's um, screen space on global illumination. It's another post-processing effect that kind of remaps a lot of the, the shaders so that it's, it really enhances the re reflections. So if I, if I add that and rebake it, and wait for it to bake a bit, then we get a, we get a lot of the, the, the lighting that we originally had from ray tracing back in. And together, these allow us to iterate really quickly. So I'm going to change my, let's close this. So this is the geometry nodes demo scene I, I sent out. And um, this is like my preferred workspace in which, oops, in which I have four quadrants. I'll have one, four, um, one window dedicated to my viewport. And I'll have I'll switch the other window to another viewport, and I'll drag off another window, and I'll have this as my geometry nodes, and I'll have this as my shaders. So I can I'm ac accessing this, this through a drop down right now. Uh, just move that away. So this is the basic setup for a geometry node system. Um, you can add these by just going to the modifier stack, adding geometry nodes. And this is basically um, kind of the boilerplate. I don't use all of them at once necessarily. It depends on what I'm trying to achieve with the, the distribution effect. But at its core, um, this is the group, this is the input geometry. So right now, I used um, an acososphere as my scaffolding geometry. Um, this one, it just it transforms the input geometry, so it's allowing you to essentially parametrically modify it. And if we ignore all of these in the middle, I've connected it down to the the point instance, which is essentially creating an instance of our our desired object. So I've selected the cone or collection, which is a collection of objects. And it creates an instance at every vertex on the on our scaffolding object. Um, this, the join geometry node, it basically merges all of the, the input geometry together as one object. And this is just the output. So if I start unmuting my geometry on my, my nodes, which I can do by hitting M, and I 
start filling the blanks. Um, I could start specifying what values I want to change um, and, and how I want to change them. So right now, I want to, if I want to randomize rotation of, of my instance objects, um, Geometry Nodes has some already built-in um, predetermined attributes that it recognizes. So rotation, um, scale are two of them. So I'm, I want to rotate um, random, my rotation here. So I'm going to write in rotation. Right now, we've already gone randomization of our, of our objects. And we can, um, if you want to do this from scratch, you can hit Shift A and really just search up um, attribute randomization, attribute randomize, or basically any of any other of these nodes. Um, and by default, you'll notice if I mute this back, it doesn't align to the vertex normals. So to do that, you would need to specify it by using an align ro align rotation to vector node which by default looks like this. And the vector we want to specify in there to get through, to align to the normals is really just normals. <laughs> and you need to um, specify that you want to change it to an attribute because the vector you're affecting is like, it's a predetermined attribute. So if I want to mute that again, and scale is very similar to this in that you just need to plug in, change the attribute value to scale. And this is the a point distribute node. A point distribute node is really just it's randomizing the distribution of how objects are, are located. And and previously when I when the old school method of doing this was using a particle system. I didn't have as much control over like where things were located, um, overlap and proximity of objects, but this allows a bit more fine control. So the default state is random. However, you can change it to plus one disk and specify the, the basically the radius in which you can have objects overlap. So if I'm right now increasing my density and but I don't want them to be too close together, I can just up the value. So together, these are like the basics of the, the visual scripting system in which we can modify geometry on the fly and have it branch off in a very nonlinear fashion. So if I want to, let me just reset this file. So if I wanted to recreate the, the initial scene I showed, I'm just gonna move this off to the side. So I'm just going to build this off by starting with a spline curve. Do I, have, I don't think my, my screencast keys are enabled. Cool. So I'm going to start with a spline curve. Um, you can access it by shift A and curve because you regular path and I'm going to rotate that. So it's it's going towards the other axis. I'm going to rotate by 90. Did I rotate it? Nope. Rotate by 90 degrees. There we go. And I want to go for like that, um, the Indiana Jones kind of God rays coming from the, the ceiling kind of effect. So I'm just going to extrude it to create this upwards facing tunnel. I'm going to align it to the side view by hitting three of my numpad keyboard. So E to extrude and E to extrude again to go up. And I'm just going to tweak this a bit by selecting the, the points, um, enabling soft select by hitting O, and I am just going to hit G to move, and I can increase the radius by just scrolling. I'm just going to tweak a few of these values. So from there, I want to actually create um, a, a shape. It's right now, it's not creating any geometry. 
So I'm going to go over to my, um, my curve tab. I'm going to go down to the bevel and increase my depth. And this is totally subjective. If I want some, some ends to be narrower than others, I can go back into edit mode. Um, I'm just tabbing in, select the point, and I can scale along the normals by hitting Alt S. Again, I'm just going to soft select to change some things. Oh. Uh, that should be fine. I'm just going to duplicate this in case I need to change it. I need a copy to change later. So I'm going to hit Shift D. I'm going to move it to another collection by M, new collection, and I'm just going to call it ref for reference. I'm just going to hide that. Cool. So because I need to actually turn this into polygons. So I'm going to hit, um, if you haven't already set this up in your preferences, I have mine set to my interface to Where is it? Yeah. By default, I have my, my space bar set to search. So it, I find it's a lot more convenient. It's what I was used to before they, they changed the whole mapping system. But you can basically search up any action you want using the space bar. So I'm going to hit space bar, convert to mesh. And now we have a bunch of vertices. I want to give it a bit of distortion. So I'm going to create a displacement, mod use a displacement modifier. Um, you can access it using the wrench on the on this tab. Right now, it's just displacing everything evenly, so I need to create a texture for that. I'm going to hit New. I'm going to go into the Textures tab at the bottom, and I'm going to use a cloud texture, which is basically a generic noise texture. Um, you can you'd fiddle with the settings if you want. I'm probably just going to go back to default. You can fill the strength. If you want to smooth it out, you can add a subsurface, um, a, not subsurface, a subdivision modifier. This is comp comparable to hitting like, your, your smoothing levels in Maya. And then if you have the, the boilerplate still there, then we can add, we can basically copy this system to here by selecting our, our tunnel we made, then shift selecting so that um, there are basically the, the instance covered icososphere is selected last. And I can hit Control L to link the modifiers together. It's basically going to copy the modifiers that are applied here onto the, the tunnel. So Control L, copy modifiers. And now we have. Um, a tunnel covered in cones, which is not what we want. <laughs> and because we are trying to make a cellscape, I need to create cells. So I'm just going to make some really quickly. I'm going to create them from cubes because I don't like pull artifacts. Um, I'm going to subdivide it a few times by Control E. Oh, Control E, subdivide. I'm just going to increase it a few, few times. I'm going to smooth out the normals by right-clicking, Shade Smooth. And I want to convert this to a sphere. So I'm going to hit Space again to Sphere. There's actually a shortcut for this, but I just I don't bother remembering it. And I'm going to hit 1, so it's like like a full. It converts it completely to a sphere. And because I want a bit of irregularity, I'm going to create another displacement map. Well, texture, there's no real map to this. So again, displacement um, modifier in the stack. So I'm going to, I can actually probably reuse the same texture. And I want to smooth this out a bit. So I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier. And again, this is hierarchy dependent. So anything up um, further up is applied first. And then anything further down is applied over top of that. 
Mm, that looks good. So I'm going to change. I'm going to go into the geometry nodes that system that I already set up, and change my instance object to the cell thing. I should probably rename this to cell. And I'm going to create its own collection just for organization. So M new collection cells. And you'll notice that um, there's no scaffold in geometry. If you want to include that for whatever reason, you can go back to your input geometry, drag the node out into join geometry. So it combines everything together. I don't want that, so I'm just going to undo that. And I want to randomize the rotation. So I'm just going to go back and unmute my rotation. And See. So these are the values I'm putting in right now. Um, so the minimum rotation, say I want 0.5 to only rotate slightly. And the maximum rotation, I want maybe 10.5. Oops. And I need to specify its rotation. That's why it's not working. <laughs> now we're looking good. I'm going to hide this. And if you really want to treat this like an actual scripting system, like similar to, I guess, a component in Unity or um, how yeah, components are basically scripts that are, have a predetermined architecture, you can expose the value by using this node. This will be regenerate every time you've used it up and plugging it into your max or your min in your max. And you can rename it by clicking on the, on the tab, the group section, and basically rename it. I'm just going to leave it for now. I'm going to remove those. Quick question, Eric. What was the shortcut you used to look like, like cat the node connections that you had? The node connections I had. Yeah, you just sort of like dragged over them and you cut those two. Uh, oh, um, connections. control it is control and right click. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, and if you wanted to have like a fork in your nodes, you can. It's the op. It's shift and right click, and you can use that if it's more more organized way for you to, to branch off and whatnot. So yeah, you know what? I might just actually take sake of convenience. Yeah. Plug that in, plug that in, rename it. Wrote min, wrote max. And this still looks way too organized. So I want to randomize the scale of it. So I'm going to unmute this node by M. And I'm going to specify scale. And we already have a bit of a variation now. Let's see. So you, you can you can mess around with it if you want. Um probably gonna leave this here. And so it doesn't look like I don't know, a kebab, a curved kebab. I'm going to randomize the distribution by again unmuting that. And now this looks like a cellscape. So if you feel that the cells are a bit too close together, you can. I've said it already had. I've already set it to Poisson disk. Again, its default is random. You can specify the, the radius in which they overlap. So I'm gonna tweak that a bit. And density max is a bit. Um, it's a bit intuitive at this point, I think. Another quick question, Eric. Why would yep. you pick uh, Poisson disk over random or one of the other options potentially for the distribution? Um, because I want more control over the, the overlap distance. Because in the past, like whenever I used to use a, a regular particle system, I would have instance objects overlapping, and that's realistically not what I what happens in real life. So if I wanted to control like how closely the, the my instance objects are together, that's when I would switch to Poisson disk. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I'm just gonna switch this to another viewport. 
and I am going to start doing some look devs. I like to have one viewport dedicated to actual, the actual rendered mode and one viewport for the unrendered mode so I can manipulate the camera a bit more easily. So if you want to um, set your camera to view, you can do control alt zero on your numpad. And that you can then N and T will toggle on and off the, the left. The, so N will toggle off the, the right menu and T will toggle off your left menu. So if you do that and you go to the, sorry, I have like way too many tabs open. You go to the view tab, you can manipulate your view in camera by clicking camera to view and just panning around. So if I want a bit lower, oh, Okay, that looks that looks pretty decent. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's zoom back out. And just for to make things cleaner, I'm going to increase my pass back to so I don't have all this distracting stuff around this outside. And let's see what it looks like right now. It should look black because there's no lighting really. Eh. It's nothing too exciting. So I'm going to, do I have a light this thing? Yeah, I have a light. I'm going to move this light. And I'm going to place it what I think is the top of the, yeah. I'm going to switch it to a spotlight. Go rotate that a bit. Rotate that again. Uh, And I'm just going to tighten it up a bit. I don't want to, because I want some like really nice God rays kind of coming through. I'm going to reduce the blend. And I'm going to increase the value because I don't think 1,000 watts is going to be sufficient. Let's go for, all right. So again, we're getting we're getting like pretty hard shadows right now. We haven't baked any global illumination or whatnot. So if you want to en enable your ambient occlusion for bloom, screen space reflections, then we're starting to see a bit of bounce lighting, some fake bounce lighting. I'm going to change the materials for the cell, original cell I did. I'm going to change it, going to create a new material. So that, that shader ball in the, it's the second last tab. I'm going to create a new material. And I'm going to drag out another window and switch that to a shader. So drop down the in the top um, left corner, shader editor. There we go. Hide that. Uh, and you could technically make it like full subsurface at this point. It's, you're not going to cause any harm. And if you look at the preview, we're already getting that effect. And if you zoom in, we're getting subsurface. And that's something normally that would make my, my computer scream in pain. I'm going to rotate this a bit. Oops. Move that out. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe. I should probably stop finicking with that. Okay, that looks good for now. I'm going to go back to changing the shader. So if you've messed around with any type of Uber shader, whether it's um, Pro Render, um, Pro, um, Render Man, whatnot, it, this should be pretty standard. Um, this is your PBR shader. Um, you can affect your, your albedo, your base color, your subsurface, your metallic, your specular, your roughness, um, and your normals, et cetera. So you can technically access a really basic version of that in your inspector. So for now, I'm just going to change the color a bit. Turn that down. And I'm going to change my subsurface color so it looks less, a little less organic and probably not have a 100 subsurface. No, that's, that's okay. And I want to actually start adding some, some fog because right now it looks really flat. So I, th I know in a lot of the 3D programs, you enable fog, I mean, volumetrics as a global setting, but you can do that as a 
well, you can enclose it within a local um, volume, local geometry, similar. And Uni, you have like um, volume as a as a cube. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add a cube. Where is the cube? OK, it's right there. Move that up. And right now, I'm going to scale it along the, the y-axis, I guess. Yeah, the y-axis. Or maybe that's a bit too much. So if you want to constrain it along an axis, you just need to hit the key. Um, so constrain it along y, it's sy. And I want to scale it in general. That's a bit, <laughs> pretty much. I'm going to scale it along the y again. Whoops. And I want it to, to, um, to conform to the shape of our tunnels. I'm just going to add an edge loop. So tab into edit mode. I'm going to control R. I'm going to slide this along, probably along here. And I'm going to go into wireframe view so I can select the back, the back vertices, select them, and hit G to move them around and rotate it. And probably move these a bit too. Cool. But if we go back to a solid view, you'll notice that. It's, it's obscuring our view. So we can fix this by going into uh, this tab. It's our it's basically object properties. And go into viewport display. And instead of display as texture, I'm going to switch it to wire. I'm just going to give this a material too. Right now, it's basic solid if you like look outside. Yeah, OK. Uh, I'm going to, by default, the default material is a PBR-based um, surface material. And we don't want this to have a surface. We want this to have a volume. And so we're going to delete this node, make sure, making sure you've selected the material. And this is the material. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, that looks right. So I'm going to delete the BSDF shader. And I'm going to change it to a principled volume. Again, if you can shift A, you can search up the, the node. So I'm going to look up volume, principal volume. Cool. I'm going to plug that in to the volume node instead of the, the surface. And you'll notice that it's black. And that's because we have density set at 100, like, uh, like 1%, like 100%. So I'm, I found that getting it to around 0.05-ish is a good starting point. And you notice that, let me just turn off my overlays. You can do that by hitting this button over here. This will give you a few other overlays if you wanted. So if you want your poly count, you can do that. I'm going to leave that off. But you're, you're noticing that we can get, we're getting a bit of um, volumetrics right now. But it's not exactly a very, very exciting color. So I'm going to switch the color to maybe a bit orangey, maybe. And I'm going to copy that over to absorption color. So you can do that. You can copy values over like colors by just hovering over the, the value on control C, control V. And I want um I want to create like because I want rays, I'm gonna create a physical gobo for this. And where is the A? Where's the plane? Okay, it's up there. I'm gonna move that around. And I'm going to subdivide a few times. So I'm going to add some edge, edge loops this way, edge loops this way. You can add more edge loops by basically using your scroll wheel. I'm going to switch the face mode and select them all. And I'm going to, I want to, in a regular pattern. So I'm going to hit space, checker, deselect. I'm going to delete all the faces. And I'm going to move that over. So that it lines up approximately with our light. I'm just going to change the light color because it's a bit boring right now. Let's go with, I don't know, maybe this pinkish color. Right now, it, it looks OK. We're, um, it's pretty dark, so we, I'm going to start baking lighting. So shift A, light probe. Um, 
I don't want to keep, I want a radiance volume again. So I'm going to scale that up so it fits this, the, the horizontal part. And one of the, one of the things I wish it had was that I could mod, I could move the individual probes around similar in Unity instead of being constrained to this box kind of configuration, but it is what it is. So I'm going to scale that a bit. And you want to avoid having these probes um, it, like crossing over geometry because what it's doing, it's basically calculating the average between light at those points and interpolating between them. So if you have one outside, one inside, it's going to be like a big discrepancy in what's light and what's dark. Uh, scale that long y again. Move that long y. Duplicate that. And I'm going to um, scale the so that it fits the, the vertical portion. And maybe it can fit that bit better. Um, I'm gonna bake it now. So I'm not gonna have anything animated here. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have it bake for everything. So I don't need to create like a static collection. So, uh, just can't remember. Indirect lighting. So yeah, render settings, indirect lighting, big indirect lighting. So you see there's no, there's, it has no data right now, really. And now we've just added back our light, our, a bit of our bounce lighting. You're getting some color casts. I'm going to enhance it further by using the SSGI add-on. And I'm going to rebake it. And I, I would say this is a better approximation of what the indirect lighting should look like. Or it's at least aesthetically more pleasing. Um, let me finish it. have it finish baking. I'm going to finish off the, sh the material here. If you want like the whole flat aesthetic, then that is totally cool too. I. I will go for a more textured look. <laughs> Let me just move this over. So I'm just going to go for textured noise. And I'm going to have it coordinates, texture coordinates. And because these have these don't have UVs, I'm just going to plug that in, and I'm going to put in a mapping node in between, so I have better control over the, the dimensions and the stretching. Oh, yep, sorry, plug this all in. Move that over. I'm going to create a, turn this into a, a normal map. So I'm going to look up normal map. Drop that in. And I'm going to pull the color value and put that in color. See how it looks. And I might. Uh, so, OK, there we go. I'm going to increase the scale a bit by using the mapping node. Uh, let's go with maybe 10. Oh, that, was, that wasn't changed. It's a bit too intense, so I'm going to pull it down to maybe 0.5. Not enough. That looks a bit better. Okay. Hmm. Cool. I want to create. Because in my original one, I think, yeah, I was able to essentially create this fall off kind of effect using the geometry nodes. I'm going to recreate that now. Um, so if you go back to, you select the, the tunnel. I'm going to create a vertex group. And so that's in the, the vertex data. So that's a plus symbol. And you, you can name it whatever you want. You just need to remember what you've named it. 
And I'm gonna go in edit mode, select all, and assign that the weight. Yeah, okay, it's all selected. Go back to my modifier tab, and I'm going to use a vertex weight proximity. And I'm gonna put that above the geometry node so that it knows to read from this before I create the geometry. I'm gonna type in group, because that was those were the vertices that it was using. And I'm going to create a, a, an effector object. So empties are basically on null objects if you're coming from C4D. I'm going to use a sphere. Where did it go? OK, it's right there. And I'm going to select that, that um, controller object. And right now, it's not doing anything because we haven't told our, our nodes to do anything, really. So. What I'm going to do is, what did I do? I'm going to add a attribute mix. And I want it to, I want to change the attribute by multiplying values. So I'm going to switch mix to multiply. And I'm the, the factor I want to change is I want to affect an attribute. And that attribute will be all. And the second one, I also want to be an attribute, but I want that to be the scale. And for the B value, um, I want this to multiply by a float, so um, a decimal number. And this will essentially be your, your floor value, so the bottom, the bottom range of how you can scale it down to. And I'm going to, the output value is also going to be a scale because it's affecting the scale ultimately. And move that over. And basically, these two nodes, they're kind of the last nodes you want to um, have hooked up. So I'm going to put that in between there. Is it doing anything? I need to increase this. Let me see. Two. Oh, I need to change this, to geom this proximity mode to geometry. And that's. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be working right now. I'll come back to that later. That it's doing something, but just not just what I want. I'm gonna increase the scale a bit. Pick up for it. Hmm. And let's see. Let's increase the just a bit. Add another light to so it's not as dark. Right now, if you wanted to um, like create more randomization in your cells, you could basically duplicate the cell. And assuming it's within the, the cell collection you've made, you can switch your instance object to a collection. And select this. Make sure you don't have whole collection set up. And you can change this by creating a different material from that. I'm just going to, I'm going to create a copy of it. 
by hitting the number. So it's only a single user, single user copy. Change the color a bit. Yeah, that's, that's, that's more like it. Mm. I'm gonna add, because in my original scene, I had a bunch of like, fibrin, collagen kind of supporting structure there. There is an add-on you can enable. I'm just move this down. And add-ons, IV, Gen. I've already enabled it. So I'm just going to take the, the original mesh we had, duplicate that. And convert this to mesh. I'm going to scale it along the normals again by selecting all, scaling around the norms by Alt S. And I'm going to select a spot where I want to grow. Uh, I'm going to move my cursor to that selected area by um, Shift S, cursor to selected. And then I'm going to create IV generator. And I'm going to disable leaves because I don't want leaves. Right there, you have you have something. I'm going to scale it a bit. Oh, where is it? Okay, it's there. Just gonna move it along the x axis. But increase the thickness by again going back to the geometry properties. Mm, I'm going to change the materials so it's not just like a generic opaque thing. Drop the roughness so it's a bit more reflective. And I'm going to hide this because I don't need the proxy object anymore. And by default, um, if, again, if you work in a game engine, materials are opaque. You need to set them to be um, transparent or translucent. So I'm going to change my settings to alpha hashed. Again, alpha hashed. And enable um, screen space refractions and subsurface translucency. I'm going to double check that I have Fraction. Okay, I haven't. I need to enable that. And I'm going to increase my transmission. And now it's starting to look glassy, which is kind of okay, I guess. Oh. Maybe full value. Yeah, now we have glass basically. Um, roughness, I'm going to pull up. So it's kind of like a frosted plastic kind of deal. And again, there's, there's pretty minimal lag. I'm not, I don't need to wait for, um, for samples to finish calculating.
I'll just move that over. I think that I'm not done with this, but a lot of it right from you here is um, just tweaking really. And I wish I could finish it. Yeah. No worries, Eric. Um, one, one thing we can do is I know with Adishan's uh, Blender 101 as well, he did do a part two. So if you want to potentially do that, record it on your own, we can definitely make sure that it makes it out to all the participants. Um, given that it is 102, I just want to let folks know that uh, if they need to drop off, they definitely can. Um, we'll be getting the recording out uh, within the next two weeks. So keep your eyes posted there. I know for myself, I'm definitely going to need uh, to go back through the recording and, and soak up all of that extra knowledge. But it was fantastic, Eric. Thank you so much for running through that. Um, are there any questions that folks want to ask in the chat? So far, we've got a couple of so cools. Uh, Gloria saying some of these tricks are brilliant. Um, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, type away in the chat. Oh, we have a gen general Blender question. Um, has anyone else experienced some Blender shortcuts don't work on a Mac? I've encountered it with the two sphere transform and also with the mute node shortcuts. Uh, while these don't work on a Mac, they work fine on a PC. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have any thoughts there, Eric. I, the I'm mute a PC user, so I'm not me. quite familiar with the Mac setup. Mm -hmm. I, I will say to, to Kara's question, because I've been using it on a Mac, um, in the very early stages uh, in terms of my Blender journey. But the mute shortcut was working for me, but there were some things that weren't. For example, right off the bat, my three button mouse wasn't working quite well, and I had to tweak the settings of the mouse and Blender to get that working. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I can't be much more help than that. Yeah, like Blender is it's optimized to work on a Linux machine at the most, and then Blender, and then Windows, and then Mac kind of gets the, the short end of the stick. <laughs> But a thank you from Jeff. All right. Well, we'll stay on for a little bit longer, just in case there's any. Uh, yes, a question. So this is going to be uploaded. Um, follow the BMCA social channels, and we're going to be posting it within the next week or two, uh, once we have a chance to trim the video and get all of the other sessions up. Um, but they'll be hosted on YouTube, so folks can review them later. And uh, for everyone here. Oh, I have people in the background for everyone here. Um, just keep an eye out for a follow-up email with resources, uh, recap, and a survey. Um, if you've been to all the classes or if you've been signed up, you'll notice that we've been sending them out. It's really helpful for us to know what's been great and uh, how we can make this even better next time. And just a quick close out uh, as, we, as we wrap up here. Thanks so much for all your support to our BMC class presenters. These have been fantastic. And to everyone who's attended, really exciting. Uh, we, we hope to continue doing this in the future. So thanks so much. We have one last Gloria. question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But Gloria was wondering if she wanted to render an animation of 10 seconds uh, using some of the settings that you've used here, how, how long would it take for that to actually render it? Um, when I tested out like with my original scene, let me just show you how, let me just share the screen again. Like it took about 15 seconds, but that was partially because I optimized some of the settings. So like if I render image, uh, it's going to load the buffer a bit. No worries. I'm not sure if you're actually sharing your screen right now either. Oh, is my scene. Oh, I didn't select the scene. Yeah. If you look at the time, it was 12 seconds to render. So it's it's fairly speedy. So if you like assuming 24 FPS and you're like, oh. The way I've set it up was uh, I dropped my, my render settings, my samples down to 32 and I've I'm using a, I'm doing some compositing. So I have a denoiser node. If you, you can use your, I guess your compositing tool of choice, whether it's Resolve or After Effects, but I usually don't like to use the inbuilt, um, where is my camera? Gloria was wondering, is that 12 seconds per frame or? Yeah, okay. per frame. And so it's not going to be quite as optimized as saying if you made the scene Unity or Unreal, but at the same time, you do have access to your more mainstream modeling tools. All right. That's perfect. I think we will end it there, as I know it is 106. Thanks again for uh, everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to be stopping the recording, uh, and then I will be ending the meeting for everyone. But I hope everyone has a fantastic Friday and a fantastic weekend.